Hey, Character Church Nation. We're so thankful that you joined us today. Whether you're a longtime member or a first-time visitor, you matter to us. These are your Character Church announcements. Be sure to kick off every first and last Saturday with prayer via conference call. Just call 712-770-4904 with extension 868-025 and take part in our powerful prayer and intercession. November is National Family Caregivers Month. If you are someone who is currently caring for an individual with Alzheimer's disease, we're praying for you. Alzheimer's disease is currently ranked as the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. More than 5 million individuals are living with Alzheimer's disease, and by 2050, this disease is projected to rise to nearly 14 million. If you are concerned about having symptoms of Alzheimer's, be sure to consult your physician today. Join us for the 90-day tithing challenge. Rather you're a new member or someone who wants to get back on track with tithing, you can accept the 90-day tithing challenge, and over the next 90 days, you can honor God by giving 10% of all financial resources that you receive. If this sounds like you, be sure to go to characterchurch.org today to sign up. The month of November is also National Diabetes Month. Did you know that 422 million adults have diabetes? That's right. That's one out of every 11 people. Diabetes is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States, and you are more likely to develop diabetes if you are not physically active and are overweight or obese. Pastor Lance teaches us that God cares about you physically and spiritually, and we want you to be in the best space physically you can be. For questions and concerns regarding diabetes, be sure to consult your doctor about diabetes prevention. Our lives have been impacted tremendously during COVID-19. But our pastor wants you to know that we are still here and we're working hard to make an incredible impact on our members and our community. We want you to know Character Church is here to support you through our Matthew 25 Alive ministry. If you are in need of groceries, you can RSVP for a pickup by emailing characterchurch.org and we will have fresh food waiting on you. Character Church Nation, we are all in at 10 a.m. Join us this Sunday and every Sunday on the official YouTube channel, Character Church. You never want to miss an interview, a powerful worship song, a special event, or an incredible word from our man and woman of God, then be sure to subscribe to our official Character Church channel. Be sure to ring the notification bell, give a thumbs up on this video, and share this video with someone you love. today. I just want to jump right into the word. If you have your Bibles, locate with me or it's provided here on the screens for you. The 18th Psalm, uh, the 18th Psalm. And if I don't give you a scripture, you can assume it's just the first verse, the 18th Psalm. And it reads in your hearing, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. The scripture goes on to say he's my shield and the horn of my salvation. Keep rolling, Nate. And it says my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. The 18th Psalm, the first three verses um, for the past few months, really, we've been doing what I would call an Old Testament survey, uh, looking at the Old Testament. Testament and kind of trying to understand it in regards to the big picture of the Bible. It's my goal as members of this church that you begin to identify what is the big picture of the Bible. And what that means, Scotty, is God's relationship with his people, why we needed Jesus, and what happens when you bring those two things together. What is the relationship that God had with his people? How does that bespeak the need for Jesus? And when Jesus shows up, dies on the cross, raises again three days later. What does that mean for you and I? That's the gospel. That's the center of our faith. But when you read scripture, how do you see it? How do you unpack that? Because if you don't understand God's relationship with his people, 
you won't understand the need for Jesus. And if you don't understand the true need for Jesus, then you don't understand how it all goes together. Amen, somebody. Amen. So, so we've walked through the Old Testament, really starting at the Egyptian bondage or Israel was under Egyptian bondage and God raised up a man to get them out of Egyptian bondage. And we saw them lost in the wilderness and transitioned into their promise. And God raised someone up to lead them into their promise named Joshua. We looked at the book of Joshua and then we saw them get organized as a nation and God raised up judges to solve their problems or help them through what they were going through. And we read that through the book of Judges. And then we began to look at the book of Samuel and how God used a man named Samuel as the last judge and they wanted a king. And God gave them what they asked for. I talked on something last week called typology, typology and how these men and women of God who God raised up to lead his people were types of Christ in a sense. They didn't represent everything that Christ was because no one could, but they were types of Christ. And when you look at Israel in the Old Testament, we can really think of typology in, in regards to Israel as they are a type of the church. They are a type of the church. Now, there are a lot of views in regards to typology in Israel. Some people uh, argue replacement theology and we have replaced Israel. And some people argue like we are uh, a remnant with Israel. I don't want to get into a seminary debate. But what I want you to do is begin to identify what or where do I fit in these stories? And when I look at the relationship that God has with Israel, I can begin to get an idea of how the relationship between myself and God works. Are you still here? This is not deep stuff. Most of you all know this, but I want you to get to a healthy place in regards to your big picture of the Bible. God is dealing with Israel and we see them over and over again make a conscious decision to go into sin. They make a conscious decision to worship idol gods. They make a conscious decision and God over and over again brings someone to redeem them. He brings someone to get them out. In Judges, it was a beautiful woman named Deborah that was a prophet. He, he brings someone to show them the way. It was Eli and then Samuel over and over again. But these men and women of God and then the first king Saul, they did not offer everything that Jesus ended up being able to offer. These people were people that had shortcomings. Moses didn't make it into the promise, not because he got old. He didn't make it into the promised land because he smoked that rock. These were people God used. They, he, he raised them up, but they could not measure up to everything the people needed to lead them. Uh, and, and it's crazy to me because in Keep Rolling Ash, God was using these men and women of God. And the people began uh, uh, to say, we want a king. They were at this fork in the road. Stay with me, y'all, where they're saying the men and women of God, you raise up. Some of them trip out. Some of them go crazy. Some of them just get old and die. Right. Joshua, he didn't do no wrong. He just died. And they're like, we, we need leadership. And we're looking at these other uh, nations and they have dy dynastic leadership. One king dies and his son becomes the king. We don't have that. So they're at this fork in the road and they say, God, we don't like how you're doing leadership. We want a king. And God is saying, I am your king. And they're saying, we want a king. And he's looking back saying, I am your king. And they're saying, we want a natural earthly king. They are at this fork in the road and they choose what they want over what God wants. How many forks in the road have you been in in your life where you have chosen what you wanted over what God wanted? But let's be honest, we get to these forks in the road and if the sex is good enough, you're going to go your way. If the money is good enough, you, you're going to go your way. If the opportunity for influence is large enough, God may be saying, don't take this opportunity. And you like, this is too much to pass. I'm taking it. How, how many of us at a fork in the road, you say other people have it, God, and I want it too. Uh, other people are there and I think I deserve it. I've served you faithfully. I've trusted you and I'm at another fork in the road. And this time I'm going this way. That is what Israel did. And God gave them Saul. Saul became king and you all are familiar with this story and keep moving with me, uh, Ash. And, and, and it's crazy because he was this humble man who didn't even think he deserved to be king. And as soon as he was king, he started feeling himself. 
As soon as he became king, he got in his pride. He like, I'm Saul. At first, when, when they said we want Saul to be king, he was hiding in the back. He didn't want nobody to pull him out. But then once he began, he realized, you know, he started. I was watching the movie uh, Two Could Play That Game last night. I don't know if you, if you all seen the movie Two Could Play That Game. And Bobby Brown, he first is like a mechanic with messed up teeth and crazy hair. And, and they say as soon as she cleaned him up and got his hair cut, he was looking at himself all in the mirror and smiling, saying, I look good. Right. And that's exactly what happened with Saul. As soon as God blessed him, he started feeling himself. Be careful when God blesses you, that you don't allow pride to kick in. Be careful when God moves on your behalf, that you don't lose the humility that it took for him to bless you in the first place. God blessed Saul because of his heart, but his heart is the reason why God took his favor off him, because his heart then became prideful. Be mindful as God elevates you, because I believe he will. Be mindful as God blesses you, because I believe he is blessing many of you right now, that your heart doesn't shift. That you don't go from this loving, giving, kind person to somebody that feels yourself and is only about yourself. Amen, somebody. So Saul starts to feel himself. He is the king. He is literally the man. He's leading all of the nation of Israel. Watch this. He has all the resources that come with being a king. He is the king. He has all the women that come with being a king. That means he has multiple wives and multiple concubines. He, he has all the money that comes with being a king. Everything that you can imagine that a king has access to, he has, but his hand, or excuse me, God's hand has lifted off of him. It is crazy to me because he experienced everything a king should experience, but he didn't experience God's best. And many of us, even in this season, you're experiencing some great things. You're experiencing open doors and opportunities and money and cars. And you have all the things that you wanted. But are you experiencing what God has for you? We have to quit equating God's favor to success and God's favor to a fine, significant other and God's favor to the type of cars. King Saul had everything, but he didn't have God's favor no more. He had everything. He, he was literally, we're reading the scriptures and God took his hand off of Saul, but Saul still got to be king for 20 plus years. So he drunk the best, ate the best, rolled the best, but God's hand wasn't on him. So, so I want to encourage you today. Don't think that a good spouse and a good job and a good lifestyle and a good nice house and a good bank account means that God's plan is flowing in your life. You still need to ask yourself, even if things have been going good for the past 20 years, am I where God wants me to be? Am I getting to experience everything that God wants me to experience? David became the one that God called to be king. David became the one that God's hand was on. Be careful when you don't <laughs> find yourself in the plan of God. Because I don't think Saul went to hell, but Saul wasn't blessed the way God wanted him to be blessed. And many of you may be on your way to heaven, but not living the God life. You may be on your way to heaven, but outside of the plans that God has for you. And you want to make sure on your way to heaven that you say, God, I'm going to get there, but I want to get there how you want me to get there, not how I want me to get there. We know some people that married the wrong person. We know some people that went into the wrong career. Field. We know some people they should have went left and they found themselves going right and they are going to heaven. God has touched their family, but they're not where they should be. And some of us, it's too late for the mistakes, but it's not too late for your future. And it's not too late for what God is going to do next. You chose them and, and you're saved. You got to stay with them. But you better say, God, what shall I do from here? You, you made some mistakes in your past, but you better say, God, what shall I do next? So as we tiptoe towards our text on today, and I'm not going to preach long, but I am going to take my time. We see King Saul is intimidated by the favor that God has placed on this young man, David. And he's after him trying to kill him. I want you to see 1 Samuel, uh, the 23rd chapter, starting at the 7th verse. It says, Saul was told that David had gone to Keilah. And he said, God has delivered him into my hands. Be careful what you say is God. Everything people say is God is not always God. I can't tell you how many people on last week I saw prophesying that Trump was going to be the president. And here they are backtracking all them prophets. Tell me, I didn't say it was God. I said it was my opinion. And you got to, I'm like, if you calling yourself a Facebook prophet, then you shouldn't have said it at all. I met somebody. And everybody named up Trump is going to be the president. Well, Biden, <laughs> Biden, well, you, you got to be careful. Well, don't, don't go up to people talking about God said you my husband. Or to, I can't tell how many people came to me and said, Pastor, God told me this is my wife. And they're not even together no more. And I'm saying, I thought God said 
that was your wife. Amen. You, you have to be mindful of what you say is God. Even me as the pastor, sometimes I'll talk to the board and say, I'm sensing that we should do this. I didn't say God said, I said, I'm sensing and I could be wrong. I could be missing what God is saying, but but I'm just sensing this is what God is saying. And maybe you guys want to trust me, but but ultimately it's not it's not some democracy where I'm trying to get votes. It's a theocracy. Let's pray about it because we want to hear what God is saying. He said, God has delivered David into my hands because David has imprisoned himself by entering a town with gates and bars. And Saul caught up all his forces, his soldiers for battle to go down to Keilah to kill David and his men. Okay, I, I don't want you all to miss what's going on with David. So I, I'm trying to give it to y'all in a, a, a way that really can connect with you all, Derek. So my sister, I remember she used to play this song all the time when we used to live together. It's a song called O3 Bonnie and Clyde. Throw, throw it up on the screen for me, Nate. O3 Bonnie and Clyde, you all remember this. All I need in this life is it. It's me and my girlfriend. Look for me. I like the little ad lib. Look for me. That's my little bar right there. I saw I say that in the car, right? Look for me. So O3 Bonnie and Clyde, this is really the first uh, introduction to Jay-Z and Beyonce together. Now, Jay-Z in his own right was a superstar at this time. Rock aware clothes, Rockefeller records. Beyonce was killing it with Destiny's Child. She was just stepping out as a solo artist. She wasn't Queen B that you know right now. She had a beehive, right? She, she was just stepping out. And this was their first introduction. And they became one of the uh, black community's power couples shortly after this. Uh, went on to do the Super Bowl and start Rock Nation and find uh, other artists and do all type of crazy huge things. We know Beyonce and Jay-Z. Many of y'all love uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z. And it's crazy because in 2013, almost 10 years to the date of them releasing this album, Beyonce was coming off of the Mrs. Carter World Tour sold out all across the world and Jay-Z was coming off the Magna Carta Holy Grail world tour. They were both on two separate tours for almost a year and some change. In the summer 2013, they came off of tour and they made a song called Bonnie and Clyde Part 2 on the run. You got it for me, Nate? Stay with me, baby. But Bonnie and Clyde Part 2 on the run. And they said, this song is buzzing. It's popular. We've been in different cities every night. They're married and haven't seen each other. They said, what we should do is get a world tour together. And they made Jay-Z and Beyonce on the run world tour. They went on this tour, Scotty. That was the one of the most uh, uh, grossing tours to date that had two people headlining. And it had never been done before where a husband and a wife went on world tour together. It's like Christian and Dez, amen, somebody just traveling the whole world uh, singing and rapping. So, so, so they, they're on tour together. It was nothing ever before seen. They, they perform in all these duets and they kiss each other in between the songs and stuff. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. It's, like, it's a husband and wife. And it was groundbreaking to see these two people on the run. And the conversation or the theme behind the tour, because they had uh, like trailers with all these guest celebrities in the trailer. Some of you all remember this. The whole idea was that we're doing what we're doing, but we're also running from those who are trying to capture us in the midst of it. They said, we're doing what we're doing. They robbing banks, they doing whatever they, they were doing, and they're together, but they're also on the run. I say all that to say that is exactly what's happening in the life of David. He's doing what he's doing, but in the midst of him doing what he's doing, he's on the run. In the midst of him leading people, in the midst of him ministering to people, in the midst of him helping people, he's also on the run. He's not just helping people and can chill out and relax wherever he is or can settle down and build a home with his family. No, 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 no. David is on the, the run. He escapes King Saul over and over and over again trying to kill him. David shows him to the palace and King Saul throws a spear at his head. This is what the Bible says. And he has to run out of the palace. And when Jonathan, King Saul's son, came and said, Daddy, why did you throw a spear? He threw a spear at his own son saying, get out of the kingdom. He shows up in different cities and Saul and his men begin to show up after him with, with horses and bows and arrows and swords trying to kill him. If priests helped him, you all were here last week, shameless plug, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. These priests would give him food and give him water and King Saul would kill all the priests that fed him and gave him something to drink. He's literally doing what God called him to do, dealing with the favor of God, helping people, blessing people. But at the same time, he is on the run. People are coming to him asking for help while he's running. P people are coming to him asking for him to resolve their issues while he is running. People are literally saying, we know you're on the run, but we need you to help us solve our problems while you're running. Many people don't know this uh, about me. But at one point in my life, I ran cross country. 
So my sister, she was um, like a crazy, great, phenomenal athlete. Um, my cousins, all crazy, great, phenomenal athletes. I was a nominal athlete. Um, so, you know, they was phenomenal. I was nominal. And my sister, she ran track. So I tried to do the hurdles like her. I couldn't do the hurdles like her. My sister ran cross country. I tried to do cross country. Let's just say I tried to do cross country. Um, I, I remember when I ran cross country, Scotty, I had a coach. His name was Coach Green. And I'd been on the team for about a month. And we hadn't had any races yet. We were just running after school. We'd be running all day on LaSalle over there in Reno Valley, just running all down the block and everywhere else. And I'm just seeing cars and I'm running, and I'm seeing dirt. And I'm just running, running, running. And he said, all right, Lance, um, this weekend we're going to go to the mountains in Reno Valley and we're going to run 12 miles. That's what he told us. He said, we're going to run 12 miles. And I said, Coach I don't know if I'm going to run no 12 miles, right? And he said, no, 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 we're going to run 12 miles. So I showed up to cross-country practice, and I had my shorts on and my, uh, my shoes, and I had a couple of water bottles there. I was ready to go. So we started running 12 miles. And I remember about that third mile, I said, oh, shoot, I don't know if I'm going to run these 12. So the coach, he was running, and he was coming back and forth and talking to people and waiting for people. So I, he called up to me. He was in front of me. He slowed down. I called up to him, and he said, Lance, you good? And I said, Coach, I'm tired. I don't know if I'm going to keep going. And he said, if you keep running, you'll get a second wind. He said, just keep running, you'll get a second wind. So I kept running, and I started to feel a little better. And he was checking on different people, and I got to about the sixth mile, and he came up to me, and he said, how you feeling? And I said, Coach, my leg feel like it's hurting just a little bit. My left leg is like tensing up on me. He said, if you keep running, you, the, the pain will subside. Just keep running. And I ran, and he said, Lance, how you doing? I said, I'm cool, but I feel like we're not getting nowhere. I'm just seeing all these same uh, mountains. Like, what mile am I on? He said, if you keep running, eventually the scenery changes. He says, right now, all you see these mountains. But if you keep running, eventually the, the, the scenery. And I found myself doing everything that he said. I kept running, and I kept running. And at the end of the day, I ran a total of 12 miles, and I quit cross country uh, the next Monday. <laughs> right? This is, a true, this is a true story. This is a true story. I was like, you know what? I, I, I met my quota. God is good. So I got it in. Right. But but I, I ran the 12 miles and I told the coach, I said, I can't believe I did. it. I went to his office on Monday. I said, I, I can't believe that I, I finished the entire 12 miles. And he said, this is what people don't often understand about running. He said, running is different than other sports. He said, you get hurt at football. Sometimes you got to just uh, sit a couple games out and get off the field. He said, but if you get certain injuries in running, the only way you'll get back on the, in the races is you got to run. He says, the only way if you get tired when you're running, oftentimes, if you're on that first one, you got to keep running to get that second win. He says, if you get tired of the scenery, you can't stop right there. The only reason or the only way that scenery changes, if you're bored and looking at those same walls and those same mountains, you got to keep running. And some of you all in here, OK, y'all are a quiet church on today, but some of you all in here, you feel like you've been running in your finances and running in your relationship and running in your career and running and you seem to never reach the goal and God's word for you today is the only way you're going to reach what you're trying to reach you got to keep running you, you can't get here and say I've been running and I'm hurt I, I've been running and I'm tired I, I've been running and it seems like nothing is changing the only way things change that the only way you'll receive the healing that God has for you, the only way you'll see something different in your life, you got to keep running. You have to make the commitment, I'm going to keep going even when I feel tired. I'm going to keep going even when it looks ugly. I am going to keep going. Second Timothy, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse, it reads like this. It says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And many of us were running, but God is saying the race ain't over. You, you can't give up because you've been running a long time Be, because a long time does not mean it's the end. I'm telling you all, when I got to that seventh mile, my back started hurting. But when I got to that eighth mile, I, I thought I said I used to be an asthmatic. I, I'm tired. I'm going to give up. But, but I had to keep running to finish the race. And God is looking at a lot of you saying, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. You cannot give up because like David, you're on the run. David is running from Saul. And in the midst of him running, God is preparing him for what his purpose is. In the midst of him running, he's learning how to solve people's issues. In the midst of him running, he's learning how to lead men and women of God. In the midst of him running, he's telling people how to deal with their debts, how to be who God called them to be. In the midst of your running, God is showing you how to be the leader he called you to be. 
And in the midst of your running, God is showing you how to be the spouse that he created you to be. In the midst of your running, he's showing you how to be the mother or the father. In the midst, y'all got to understand God is doing something while you're running. But if you stop running, if you give up now, you'll never be who he created you to be. David is on the run and we're in 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter. He's on the run, and it says in the ninth verse, when David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abathar the priest, you remember him last week, he's the only priest that survived, and David said, I'll protect you. He told the priest, this is what I need you to do, priest. He says, bring me the ephod. Now, we see certain words in scripture, and you just uh, zoom right past it because you don't know what it means. You like an ephod, okay. <laughs> you trying to guess in your mind, is, is it like a xylophone? Is it an ephod? Like, what is it? He like, bring me the ephod. I don't, I don't know what an ephod is. Amen. And he literally says to this priest, he says, bring me the ephod. What an ephod was, it was a prayer garment. It was a prayer garment, and they believe it was something you put over your shoulders, and it went over the front of your chest and the back of your chest. The best way I can illustrate it to you is like a football player's shoulder pads. So you would get this thing, and you would put it over your head, and it was a prayer, uh, 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 um, like a prayer clothes, if you would. He said, bring me, what would you say, Terry? Yes, it, it, that's exactly what it is, like a breastplate. He says, bring me the ephod. And the reason that he wanted to get the ephod is because he wanted to go into prayer. And in this culture and this context, when they put on an ephod, it was an instrument of almost divination. So when they grabbed the ephod, this was their idea that God is going to hear me when I put this on. So in a real sense, when he found out that Saul was trying to kill him, he said, give me the ephod because I'm on the run, but I need to run to prayer. He says, I'm on the run, but I need the ephod because what I need to do in this moment, because the king is trying to kill me, I need to run to prayer. David, in his situation, in the culture and context he lived in, they talked to God by grabbing an ephod. So he says, give me the ephod so I can pray. And he began to pray. That's what David did. This is my next point. It's on the screens. We know what David did. But in this season of your life, in the culture and context you live in, he ran to prayer. But I want to ask you, what do you run to next? See, we can't always look at what these Bible characters ran to and think that's exactly what we do in our situation. Because everything in the Old Testament is not necessarily for us to gain some great principle out of. Everything is not some allegory that we look at and learn a lesson. Some of this is just what happened in these people's lives. And yes, you can get something out of it, but you can't say, well, I saw that David went to prayer, so I better go to prayer. Some of y'all been praying for six years and God been told you what to do. It's no longer your prayer time. It's your due time. It's no longer your fast time. You already went on a 67 day fast. God has already told you what to do. And the question that I have to ask you on this Sunday, where do you run next? Many of us are playing, thinking it's time to pray. And God is saying, quit asking me what to do. Quit talking to me. You, you all have, I, I don't know about you, I got, I got kids. So my son, he'll say, dad, can I have yogurt? And I'll say, no. And then he'll say, dad, can I have yogurt? And I'll say, no. And he'll say, dad, can I have, and I'm like, why are you asking me a fifth and sixth time for yogurt? My answer is not going to change. And in the same sense, God is looking at you like your spiritual father saying, son or daughter, why are you asking me this? It's not your time to run the prayer. You have to say, uh, uh, did God already tell me where to run to next? Did God already tell me what to do next? And here I am sitting here praying, acting like I don't know what to do because I have a lack of faith, because I have a lack of trust. Bishop G.E. Patterson, he said it like this. I was watching uh, uh, all the old convocations in the Church of God in Christ that GE preached at on this past weekend. And he said it like this. And you all have heard this saying before, but I believe he may have been one of the first people to say it. He says, everybody in here in relations to a storm is either on their way into a storm, on their way out of a storm or smack dab in the middle of one. And depending upon the position you're in in relations to storms, what you do next is different. See, where I'm at in my storm means I have a very different next step than you. Going into a storm, you need to say, it's time for me to prepare. If I'm not in nothing, if everything's going good, maybe it's time for me to start putting some money aside just in case something happens. 
Maybe I don't need to go on all these vacations. Just go on two and save a couple thousand dollars. Man, I, I, everything is going well right now. Maybe this is time for me to start putting something away, put, putting some, uh, just investing a little more love into my relationship so when something jumps off, my spouse feels good. To, to maybe show up on time on my job. Nobody's tripping, but when somebody does trip, I want to make sure it can't nobody tell on me and say that I've been late. You, you, you have to do something different than somebody's on the brink of losing their job. You're on the brink of losing your job. Maybe what's next for you is time to call HR. And so, you know what? I didn't do that. I didn't say that. And here are the emails to prove it. Amen, somebody. You, you, you need to figure out what do I do next? We cannot look at David and copy what David did when your name is not David. It's Chris. And say, God, what are you telling me at a moment in his life where the king was trying to kill him? He needed guidance. What do you need based on the race you're running? Well, where do you need to go? Maybe where you need to run to next is patience. But maybe where you need to run to next is strength. He said, I don't need to pray. God already told me what to do, but I need to run to stand strong. I need to be somebody that's chasing after long suffering. But maybe where you need to run to next is forgiveness because you have some unforgiveness in your heart. And God is saying, I'm not going to give you some supernatural unforgiveness. You have to choose to forgive them. And you have to run to that thing. Th this is one of the most important things you can do. Be intentional about what you do next. Andy Stanley, who's one of the greatest leaders in our nation, his father is named Charles Stanley. Y'all probably seen him on TV and didn't know he's this old, old, old white pastor. His son, Andy Stanley, is about 50 years old. He has a church with over 200 locations in the South. And he said it like this. It's on the screens for you. He says, everyone gets somewhere, but not everyone gets their own purpose. He said, everyone gets somewhere, but not everyone gets their own purpose. And I want to challenge you what you do next, where you go next, where you land next. Make sure it's on purpose. Make sure that you say, God, this is what you're calling me to do next. This is where you're calling me to be next. And I'm making a conscious decision to go there because you have led and guided me to that place. And God does not speak to all of us the same. Please hear me now. Some of us, God, you, you feel it in your heart strong what God is telling you to do. Others of us, you know that God speaks through you maybe through a sermon or, or God speaks through you maybe during your worship time. But you better listen to what God is saying and get to where you're going next on purpose. Be intentional. With everything going on in this country, y'all, you better be intentional. We, I, we talked about it. Joe Biden just won. Uh, he's the president elect. And people was cracking all type of jokes. And I cracked a couple jokes, too. But some of them I didn't fire off. I was about to post and I said, you know what, God, I feel you. I'm not going to post this one. I'm telling you about three, four of the memes. I was, I was ready to fire it off. And I'm like, you know what? I want to be intentional uh, about what I, I'm going to crack a couple jokes because I'm crazy like that. But I'm going to be intentional and not let them all off because I want to be intentional about what I do. I want to make sure, Lord, that even when I play a little bit, I'm still within where you want me to be. Even when I push the envelope a little bit, I'm still being the person that, that you called me to be. Your career move, your, your relationship move. The thing that you do with your dream, how you raise your kids, what you do with your job, if you buy that car, that property, whatever you're about to do, be intentional about what you do next. But first Samuel, the 23rd chapter and the 10th verse, everyone gets somewhere, y'all. Not, not everyone gets there on purpose. David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Keilah and destroy the town on account of me. He is in the city called Keilah. He says the king is on his way to kill me and everybody in the city. He says, Lord, the king is on his way to kill me. And y'all see it right here. He says, Lord God of Israel, I've heard that Saul plans to come and destroy everybody. Y'all seen last week the priests helped David. What happened to the priests? They got killed. In Keilah, they were at war with Philistines. You can read it in the entire chapter of 1 Samuel 23. That's your homework this week. He, he, they, they were at war, and he said, God, should I help them? And God said, yes, help them. So he went and fought a battle alongside them. And I'm sure when he fought alongside them, they embraced him as a brother. I'm sure they gave him some water as he was helping them win that war. I'm sure they gave him some food and a place to stay as he was helping them with that war. And in the middle of him helping them, he gets word that Saul is coming to kill him. And he's sure that Saul is coming to kill them also. 
But I need you to recognize how Keilah is set up. Keilah is comparable to Jericho, that it's a fortress. It has these great walls that people could not destroy. That's how they were able to defeat the Philistines. So Keilah is this city that is not just wide open and anybody could get in. It's a city that's very uh, uh, protected. And he's at this place in this city with a circle around it. And Saul says he's locked in. He's caged in. And I can imagine David is thinking, if we got to go to war, we got these walls and we good. He's thinking, we have this fortress. I have a refuge. This city is a refuge. Nobody gets in or nobody gets out. Saul's thinking, he's caged in. I'm going to just come in. They'll let me in and kill him. David's thinking, these people, I just fought a battle with them. We should be good, Lord. But is he going to defeat the city? Dave is under the impression Saul's coming to attack. And y'all process this like he's processing. I'm in a fortress. I'm in a refuge. We probably can win this fight. But but David, he's saying, you know what? I want to know God because I feel called to prayer next. What is going to happen? Did I tell you all that 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 he got the ephod? I told you all that, right? I told you all he spent time talking to God about what to do next. Right. I told you all that. So he wasn't just saying we can handle them because we have a refuge and a fortress. He was not just saying that. What he was literally saying is we have the tools we need, but I want to make sure I have your favor in what I am doing. He says, we probably could withstand the fight, but I want to make sure I have your favor. And I want you to look at what happens in the next verse. First Samuel, the 23rd chapter and the 11th verse. It says, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard, Lord God of Israel? Tell me now. And the Lord said he will. Give me the 12th verse if you have it. And again, David asked, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said he will. David just helped them win a war. Now somebody's coming to kill him. He goes to prayer and God says, they're going to come kill you. Not only are they going to kill you, the people you just helped, they going to turn you over to him. They said the people that you just helped win a war, when Saul shows up, they going to hand you to him in a handbasket. They they going to put you in some handcuffs and give you right to him because they saw what he did to them priests. And they do not want to die. So what they're going to do is give you to the king so the king can kill him. And he went to prayer and God said, what you need to do is pack your bags and go. What you need to do is get all your 600 men together who've been fighting all these. This is not your battle. So just because you won last week doesn't mean you're going to win this week. That's the power of prayer. Just because it worked out last time doesn't mean you stay and think it's going to work out this time. No, no, no. This is a little different. I know it looks the same, but it's not going to end the same. You better get your tail up out of here. This is what God told him to do. He says you will die because these people will not protect you, even though the city's a fortress. Even though they probably could withstand the war, even though he could find refuge in that city. God says they're not going to help you. You, you. you better get out of there. It's time for you to go. In a real sense, what God was telling him is there's no questions. There's no commas. Leave. Saul's on the way. Go. This is my next point. y'all. If you're taking notes, I say it often, but I really mean it. Write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. What you need to run after is clarity. We need to run after clarity around what God is telling us. There is no gray area about run. <laughs> There's no gray area about you going to die <laughs> if you don't leave. That they're going to kill you if you do not go. David didn't have to question what he should do because God was very clear to him. He didn't have to question if he should stay a few more weeks or if the battle goes right and we seem to be losing. I'll leave. No, he knew right away. You better get your tail up out of Keilah. You better get on your horse and get your men together and tell them it is time to go. The issue with our faith, my sisters and my brothers, is rarely clarity. The issue with our faith is often commitment. I don't believe that God is just some ambiguous God. Now, there are times where God is saying, you just have to step out on faith, and I'm not giving you an answer. Those are real times where God says, I'm not going to make it black and white. You just have to step out and make a move. Those times do happen in our lives. But there are other times where God is very clear about what we're supposed to do. And the issue is not clarity. The issue is commitment. And it's time for us to begin to commit to what God has called us to do. When he gives you clarity, run after that. 
Be who he told you to be. Start what he told you to start. Go where he told you to go. Love how he told you to love. Be somebody that says, Lord, you said it and that settles it. It's very clear to me. It is very clear to me what I should do next because you may, I prayed and you said leave. I prayed and you said stay. And it does not matter what my mama said when I got on the phone with her after I prayed. It does not matter that they tried to offer me an increase in pay after I prayed. No, you gave me clarity and I'll do what you said. Run after the clarity. I, see, uh, I really feel like this is one of the most important things in the life of the believer. is to really trust what God is saying. And the only way that you'll develop the boldness to do it, it's just like running, is if you start to do it. The only way you'll really develop the boldness to trust God is to say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I, I, I believe that this is you. I feel about 85 percent sure that this is what you told me to do. I'm going for it. I'm pretty sure I'm going for it. And watch how God will bless you. And we want the favor before we give the commitment. That's what we often want. We, we want the we want the God's hand to move before we commit. So God says go and you haven't moved an inch yet. But you're like, yeah, God, but I don't see you uh, opening doors yet. I don't see you blessing yet. And God is like, yeah, because I don't see your feet moving. And you got to begin to run after clarity. You, you have to run after what God is calling you to do. Don't be someone when he clearly tells you move, you stay still. Run after what he was clear about. We're in the text, 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the 13th verse. We're almost out of here. 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter and the 13th verse. It says, so David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah. They kept moving on the run from place to place. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. Y'all see, he couldn't get a hold of him because he did what God said. He couldn't get a hold. He was he's on the run. And the reason he wasn't caught is because he simply did what God said. David escaped with his life. He goes to Keilah. He saves a fortified city, a city with walls around it, a city that should have and could have been a refuge, especially after he fought a battle and saved them. But they would not save him. God says leave and his life is fair. OK, I preached a little backwards today. y'all. I know that I preached a little backwards. Um, I preach like this uh, on purpose because normally at the beginning of my message, I give you guys my sermon title and y'all probably understand or could guess what my sermon title is. But my sermon title on this Sunday is on the run. Right. That's my sermon title. I normally try to open and give you all my intro. I would have hit you with the Jay-Z and Beyonce at the beginning, but I didn't feel like that on this. Sunday. I want to put it in the middle. Uh, my sermon title on today is on the run. And we need to make sure that we are on the run for God in everything that we do in our lives. We need to make sure we are on the run moving towards what God called us to moving into what he created us for what he given but he's given you clarity about are you on the run towards that we need to be on the run and we are looking at first Samuel the 23rd chapter but I'm not preaching on the book of Samuel anymore I'm trying to get you all to understand the Old Testament in regards to the big picture of the Bible. We've looked at the uh, we've looked at the historical books. We've looked at the Torah, the first five books. We've looked at the historical books and you guys are beginning to see the history and how God brought them out of bondage. He brought them into a promise and rose up judges and then they asked for a king and he blessed them with the king. We see how the kings were established now and now you can put it on the screen. I want to go into the poetic books by looking at the book of Psalms. And Psalms is this amazing book with all these great songs in it. S-O-N-G-S, songs. Really, it could be called the book of songs. That's what Psalms translates to is songs. When you read the songs of Solomon, some Bibles have it as the Psalms of Solomon. So when you look at this, it's just songs or they call it the songs of songs. You guys seen that before. These words are interchangeable. But when we look at these Psalms, I could not teach on Psalms. The 18th Psalm is what I open with without also giving you the first, uh, excuse me, first Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Because Psalms are the songs people sang in the midst of what they dealt with as they lived. Psalms are the songs people sang in the midst of what they went through. So as I faced a problem in my life, I sung this song. As I dealt with this person trying to kill me, I sung the, this song. David in 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, goes to a city called Keilah. It's a fortress and what should be a refuge. 
The people are indebted to David because David just saved their lives by taking over a battle they were fighting and defeating the Philistines. And here he is in a position where God is saying, you better leave because with them, you're not going to find no refuge. You, you better leave because even though they have great walls, those great walls will not be a fortress for you. I hope you guys see this, that they have walls. They, they could be a refuge. They should be a fortress. And God says, run. And as David is running in 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, as he's on the run, he writes the psalm, the 18th psalm. It's on the screens for you. Starting at the first verse, it says, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and he is my fortress and he is my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my strength and the horn of my salvation. This is what he said. Keep going. It says he's my stronghold. I called on the Lord who is worthy of praise and I've been saved from my enemies. David is in this place where these people could have helped him and he just helped them. They're in a city that is a fortress and could be a refuge. And God is saying those people are not going to save you. He's literally looking at a fortress and looking at a refuge and they're not going to help him. So on the run, I could imagine he's leaving the city looking at a fortress and he writes and saying, the Lord is my fortress. He's looking at what should be refuge and he's saying the Lord is is my refuge. They owed him a favor and could have helped him. And if they would have helped him, he would have said, thank you guys so much. I'm so appreciative that you helped me kill the king that's trying to kill me. But they didn't help him. So he said, and it was on the screen, it's okay. He says, the Lord is worthy of my praise. I don't have to give y'all no credit because y'all wouldn't help. I don't have to call Keilah my fortress because Keilah would have killed me. The person that's there for me is the Lord. He is my rock. He is my fortress. He is the one. So when we see his problems in 1 Samuel 23, we also see his praise in the 18th Psalm. And when you read scripture, you cannot just look at the psalm and think it stands alone. It's not incorrect. It's just incomplete. These psalms go with people's situations. And as you read scripture, I want to encourage you to begin to find the situations that the psalms are associated with. It's my goal for you to be able to read scripture in a healthy way. We get up often and say, I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the, y'all know that. But we don't understand that David wrote that song after they had overtook Jerusalem and a land that the enemy once occupied, God's people had again. And he said, I'm glad when they say unto me that we can go into the house of the Lord, something that we once could not do. Now God has empowered us to do. I am glad because I can do this. And it's because God has favored us to defeat our enemies. These people tried to occupy something that belonged to our fathers and we've taken it back. And there's power associated with that song. And many of us look at it as a way to say good morning in church, missing the fact that what he was saying is God is powerful to take back everything that the devil stole from me. See, some of us, we went through hell in our relationship and now your relationship is in a good place, you can look at that psalm and say, I relate to that spirit. I was glad when they said unto me that I have back what should have been mine, and it wasn't, and I have it back again. The devil tried to steal my finances, ruin my career, take over uh, my whole financial situation, and now I find myself in a place where I was down, but I'm back up. And I'm glad when they say unto me, you look like you're doing good in your finances. Be because I wasn't always here, but now I am. And we have to be able to attach the psalm with the situation. So as we read scripture, we understand why are these poetic books here? Well, why they just got these songs just written here? Well, they were written because people were living lives. And in the midst of their problems, they were giving God praise. You, you can't read the 90th Psalm without understanding the story of Moses. You, you can't read the 72nd Psalm without understanding the story of Solomon. Or we begin to look at these Psalms and we miss the power of what's associated with them. Well, we miss the power of what God, what was trying, oh, okay. I feel like y'all getting it. I normally say there's some type of cognitive disconnect between the preacher and the pew, 
for y'all my good class today. Y'all understand everything that I'm saying. But I just want to say this part of the sermon because I thought it was cool when I wrote it, Terry. So y'all know who Michael Jackson is. He's one of the biggest artists of all time. One of the greatest perform not one of, the greatest performer of all time. In my opinion, the greatest artist of all time, Michael Jackson. And people say the Beatles, but what's cool about Michael Jackson is he owns the Beatles. Uh, 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 y'all know what I'm talking about. He owns their uh, masters. So shut up, Beatles, because he owns y'all anyway. So uh, you, y'all know uh, Michael Jackson. He, he's this crazy, amazing artist. Throw it up on the screens for me. And, and he had this album that came out. I want to say it was 83 or 84. I forget. Y'all pray for me. Uh, called Thriller. And we all know and love this album, Thriller. We, uh, I just uh, DJed a whole party last week, and I think I sent the video to my sister where we was doing a whole Thriller. I had 500 kids doing a whole Thriller dance with me. Uh, virtually, it was crazy, right? We, we love this. Um, and it, it's an amazing album, but it's also iconic because of the music videos. And y'all remember Billie Jean, and he was walking on the boxes, and the boxes on the ground was lighting up, and it was like a homeless dude on the floor in the corner, and it was like a weird, cra- it's the 80s, right? It's a different time. You, you had to be there, right? But it's this crazy video, and y'all remember the PYT video, and it's like he in, he in space or something, right? Like, where is he at? And then uh, uh, the Thriller video is arguably still the greatest video of all time. It's still, and they said that they didn't even have a real plan for Thriller. Michael just kept coming up with stuff. He just was like, we're going to do this, this, and this. And they was like, okay, we're going to add that to the storyboard. And they said, Thriller is all Michael's genius. He, he just kept coming up with things. And you all don't know, the woman in that video, I want to say she was Miss America. And, like, she won Miss America, and she was just in that video and never heard from again, right? It's just like she was in that and was gone, right? And so it's this crazy video. You all have seen it. And we watch these, and we're like, this is cool. And I love Michael. And my mama played these songs, and we listened to them at the family reunion. And I like Thriller. And you do the dance when a video comes on, and maybe you had a red leather jacket. But you don't really understand the Thriller album or those videos on their own, you also have to understand what he was living when he wrote those songs. You have to understand what he was living when he made those videos. See, we oftentimes, well, not we, history tells itself from the lens of the people in charge. So you often will miss a lot of things about history if you weren't there, right? Our kids are not going to fully understand everything that happened with Donald Trump because they wasn't there. And the history books may not tell it exactly how we experienced it as African-American people in America. Amen, somebody. So when you go back to the early 80s, MTV did not play black music videos. And the reason they said they would not play black music videos is they said, we just play the videos that we think are great. So it's not a black thing or a white thing. We just play the videos that we think are great. And they would have hit records on the radio, multi-platinum selling albums, and they couldn't get their video played on MTV. So what Michael Jackson decided to do was make the best videos anyone had and say, deny the video now. So he showed up with the Billie Jean video, and they had to play the video. Because he says, when you cut on Duran Duran and Boy George, I know this video is better than that. So they could not deny him. So they played the Billie Jean video, but their plan was, we're going to play this, but nobody's going to have the Michael Level type video. We don't even think he'll do it again because the budget was too big. And after the Billie Jean video, he dropped the PYT video. And he said, on one of y'all videos versus this video, y'all better play my video. So not only did they play the Billie Jean video, they played the PYT video. And they said, we'll play this until it's out of rotation, but we're not going to have this black content on our station. And what did Michael Jackson turn around and do? He dropped the Thriller video. And he says, this is the greatest video of all time. So y'all going to play Billie Jean PYT, and y'all dang sure better find yourselves playing all 14 minutes of Thriller. He's funny because he's also a jerk for making it 14 minutes. He said, y'all want to be rude to me and not play my video? I'm going to make a 15-minute video that you all are going to have to play. And as a kid growing up from the 80s into the 90s, you might have said to yourself, I'm scared of it when I was young, but now I like it and I get it. But you didn't realize when he was living it, the reason he made that was to prove a point that you all are being racist and I'm going to force you to change. And without Michael Jackson making that album and those videos, people don't know this. I did my study on this week. MTV was about to go bankrupt when he put those videos on the channel. And them allowing black artists brought a whole new audience into the channel and it saved music television. And Michael Jackson and those videos changed the entire world because we wouldn't have MTV. We wouldn't have none of the stuff that we got right now, the VMAs, nothing. And we wouldn't have black videos on TV like we do. Amen, somebody. And it's all because he made the choice. I'm going to put some crazy, quirky videos out with makeup and the ground lighting up and everything else. And he changed the world. But what we'll do is turn on Thriller in 2020 and say this was cool. 
But you don't realize the power behind that video. You, you don't realize really the meaning of Billie Jean. It wasn't just that he really had some woman who was obsessed with him and said that he, she had a baby by him and he didn't even know her. It wasn't just that, but it was also the fact he was trying to change the world. So the passion behind it was different. The meaning behind it was different. And in the same sense, when we read the Psalms, you can't just read the Psalms like some of y'all used to look at the Billie Jean video. You got to understand, OK, what was happening when this was written? What was the purpose behind this being sung? I'm no longer just going to say, uh, 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 the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. No need to understand what was going on when he said that. And some of us today, we look at shepherds, and in this culture, shepherds walk behind the sheep because they have shepherd dogs. So if we look at it and say, the Lord is my shepherd, you may get the idea that God is behind you orchestrating everything. But in their culture and context, they didn't have shepherd dogs. They walked in front of their sheep. And God is in front of us, leading us to where we're going. So you really have to begin to ask yourself, what is really happening? David had a problem in 1 Samuel 23, but he had a praise in the 18th Psalm. And this is my last point, and we're going home. you got to run after praise. Well, we can't just look at 1 Samuel 23 without also looking at the 18th Psalm. And say David had problems. Somebody was literally trying to kill him. The people that could have had his back didn't have his back. But he didn't get discouraged. His song was God is my fortress. He didn't get upset. He said God is my refuge. And I want to encourage you to run after praise. No matter what your problems are. No, no matter what you are facing. No matter what it feels like. You got to say I am running after praise. I'm going to continue to praise you with the fruit of my lips. And watch how God will continue to bless you because you blessed him. Amen, somebody? We're going home, but I want to pray with you all because I believe for some of us, God really is waiting for us to commit to what he's already given us clarity about. He's waiting for us to run to what he's already given us to do next. It's not a question of what should you do. It's a question of when will you do it? And I want to pray that you have the boldness to walk into what he called you to.